So, Catherine, I just wanted to know, what do, do you know what um, midwives and prostitutes have in common? No. Would you believe it? I've never really thought of it. You'd better tell me. So, the, they're both the oldest professions on the planet. We've both been around for a very long time. <laughs> That's my definition. Brilliant. Right. <laughs> Great. <laughs> My name is Catherine Graves, and I'm with two amazing in, independent midwives, which is Jackie Tompkins and Kemi Johnson. They will introduce themselves in a minute. Please see this through. It is so, so important. It's important for every mother and baby in this country. And not many people know what's going on at the moment. I want to get this to as many people as possible. So the situation for independent midwives is understood by everybody if possible. I'm just going to ask Jackie and Kemi to introduce themselves first and tell you who they are. Jackie, would you like to go first? Yes, sure. I'm Jackie Tompkins. Um, I'm an independent midwife and I've been working as an independent midwife for uh, 22 years. Um, I work in London mostly and I'm also the chair of I'm UK. That's the organisation that represents self-employed midwives. Uh, and you've done a huge amount of work on getting insurance for independent midwives, haven't you? Which is a major issue at the moment. Yes, I have. I've been working for the last six years on um, trying to find a solution um, for independent midwives so that they can continue to just do their job um, and work. Um, it's been a bit of a long haul and we still haven't got there yet. Great, thank you. Kemi. I'm Kemi Johnson. I've been working as an independent midwife for 10 years in London and Sussex. And I, I'm hoping that today we can really get to the bottom of what we are, why we need to exist. And hopefully it will help other people to understand why we need to remain and how we can take things forward. I think the first question is, since we've talked about independent midwives already, what is an independent midwife? Good place to start anyway, isn't it? Who wants to go on that one? Um, I, I, I can, in a nutshell, tell you that an independent midwife is a self-employed midwife. She is a midwife that's done all of her training through the NHS. She's probably worked within the NHS for a great number of years. They're uh, hugely skilled and experienced midwives, but they choose to work outside of the mainstream employer and um, directly link up to women. Um, and they're able to offer a very personalised service um, that really enshrines the continuity of care and model. I think that's beautifully described, actually. We, you know, we work direct to the family. Um, we use all that we are, all of our training, um, all of our skills. We acquire many skills post the, N the, the NHS training, actually. Um, there's a special art to being in the home and creating that safety and that warmth and that trust. Um, that really does appear to reduce unusual outcomes. We tend to get the most spectacular outcomes from the most unusual circumstances, like, you know, twins and breech babies and, you know, home birth after three cesareans and things, spectacular results. And I think it's, it is an art and we don't seem to quite in the NHS training, but it's the post NHS training. And it's, it's, it's we're almost like an apprenticeship. We, we, you know, we go under the wing of more experienced independent midwives and learn some spectacular skills. I just wanted to Kemi, add that. Kemi, do you want to tell us, you talked about the training. What is the training? Um, mm. People start in the NHS and then come out. Can you tell us a little bit more? Yeah. Uh, what is different about the training of an NHS midwife and an independent midwife? Um, how have you got where you are? Well, I, I don't think this is just an opinion because I've heard it from other student midwives as well. What we seem to learn in the NHS, we talk a little bit about how birth can unfold what we would consider normal, normally. Um, so we spend a bit of time on that, um, particularly in the university when we're doing our academic um, training, at, uh, when, we're, when we're writing our essays and sitting our lectures, etc. cetera. But um, when we go into practice, all we usually see is intervened with births from the get-go. 
um, mostly medicalized births, hardly any home births. I was lucky. I saw a couple with, within the NHS. I, I, I saw experience of home births outside of the NHS of independent midwives um, when I was a student. So, um, and also I saw some as a doula before I even trained. But the NHS, there are very few opportunities to see physiological birth. So from the get-go, we were learning things that weren't helpful, like extracting babies. <laughs> see if you've got a dry throat. Extracting babies, you know, rather than letting them come out the way they're designed to. We see a lot of people on their backs. Um, we'd see cords being unwound. You know, these are by mentoring midwives. Cord, you know, feeling for cord, unwinding the cord. Um, before the rest of the baby's born, all of it is poor practice. Um, so we'd see a lot of poor practice, which obviously would confuse us because we'd learn the right way in the university and then go into practice and it all be undone. Um, I, actually, I trained um, in KG Hypnobirthing two uh, student midwives and they said doing the student mid midwifery degree was the hardest thing they'd ever done because it yeah. all be academic work and working in um, in hospital at the same time. Yes. And some of them had families too. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Which is really impressive. Jackie, why did you leave the NHS way back? Um, because I was, I was just not able to practice autonomously. And it, when, when I felt confident enough in my skill and my knowledge base, I felt that what I was being forced to practice was possibly um, was po possibly poor practice. And I didn't really want to continue to be a poor practitioner. I wanted to continue um, with providing excellent uh, gold standard level of care. And I, I wanted to know the women that, um, that were coming to me uh, for their births. So that was not also, and also that was another important factor. Um, it, within a hospital setting, you really don't know if you're working on a shift pro, um, basis that you don't know who's going to come through the door to you. You do your best for them. It's incredibly emotional work. You're you're you, you really are expending a lot of emotional energy, and every midwife that that you know, works in the NHS wants to do the absolute best, but we really do have constraints, usually to do with your employment um, uh, preferences, that, you know, if, you, if you're employed, your employer wants you to work in a certain way, which will streamline the service that they're providing, which basically comes down to not giving you enough time and your woman enough time to, to achieve what, you, what you're hoping to achieve with them, for them, to make them have a really fantastic experience. Um, and that was just too difficult for me to, to come to terms with. And I just, I really needed to be able to practice autonomously, have, um, really develop my clinical judgments and skills and, and, and understand and know my client base, um, which, which, is, which is what I found within independent practice in, almost immediately. Kimmy, did you, do you want to add anything to that about why you left the NHS? Um, yeah, I'd love to. I mean, mine was a more an emotional um, decision um, than a head decision. I was acquiring all of this amazing knowledge outside of the services by my third year of training. And um, it just became really um, discordant with what I was seeing happening within maternity service of the NHS. So it just wasn't a comfortable place to stay in. I just felt like I was betraying um, the knowledge that I'd acquired in university and the knowledge I was acquiring watching physiological birth. I then began to feel like I was complicit in diverting women's experiences away from healthy physiological birth. And then that all became quite unbearable. So, um, yeah, it was just a, a heart decision to leave. That's pretty heady stuff, isn't it? Yeah. So you've both left the NHS, practicing outside the NHS. How does uh, a mother, a couple who employ you, know that what are your sort of disciplinary procedures that you're practicing safely? How a couple will know, um, usually, I, I'm sure that's the same for Jackie, the way we are working is by recommendation. 
So it's usually one couple telling another and another. That's that's how we've managed to, you know, be booked by all these families. And then the, the families are very intuitive. Like, um, you know, the the mother, the birthing person will know exactly what they what they envision envision their birth will be. And then they'll start to, you know, give us some pointers as to what they're looking for. And then they'll be listening really carefully for the answers. You know, it's, it, they, there's lots of exploration happening between the family and the midwife in those, because those, we usually spend a couple of hours at, at each antenatal. So as we know, all the measuring and checking takes, what, 15 minutes maximum. There's a lot of time spent feeling out, that, you know, they, they ask questions like, what would you do if? And they're asking that because they might have heard a scary birth story in the week before they met you or, you know, between your antenatals. So what would you do if, and then they're judging you by your answers. And then now, you know, we then get tested in the Facebook groups because then they'll go in there and say, oh, my midwife said blah, blah, blah. And then another midwife will say, well, that's rubbish because it could be done this way or, you know, so, it, but it, this is the power that we want families to have. It's so important that this, birth happens in the best way possible for them for loads of reasons not just that they're both alive at the end there's a lot of you know morbidity that can happen if things aren't done well so they're always checking us you know it's not just oh you know we've made our decision that's it they're always checking us and and a lot of the couples that I look after are really big readers they read a lot and you know they they're, they're usually in groups and they ask other questions so you can't be you can't be asleep on the job <laughs> you've got to you yeah. got to know your stuff, you know, and that's yeah. how they test yeah. us. Absolutely. And, it, and that whole relationship is all built, built on trust, on, on reciprocal trust. So you're, you're, you're getting to know them, they're getting to know you. Um, you know, in, or every independent midwife in the UK is, um, is, is, is governed by a regulatory body. Um, so we, we all... I think all that's the, what mums would like to hear, to be yeah. sure. Yes. yes, we're all we're all uh, we're, we're all governed and, and disciplined in exactly the same way that an NHS midwife would be, except that possibly NHS midwives will have a an internal investigation done maybe by the hospital, which would never get really get to the uh, regulatory body. Um, independent midwives tend to mostly um, be referred directly to the NMC. So the NMC will have a look to see if there's any cause for complaint, for the complaint. And if there is, that, that there will be a hearing based around that. But th thankfully, we, we've never had any major um, serious incidents. Um, in fact, independent practice is well known for, for being safe practice. Wonderful. Just so that everybody knows, the NMC is a Nursing and Midwifery Council. That's right. Which is the um, body that oversees all the different. Yes. Um, and also, just one other thing, I think in this uh, section, um, people think independent midwife, private midwives, they're making a lot of money, they're only for wealthy people. Uh, Jackie, what would you say about that? Um, and, well, carry on. <laughs> well, you know, <clears throat> I think everybody seems to think that anything private is is you know, big bucks. Uh, it, it really, really isn't. Independent midwives will take a small caseload of women that they will dedicate their their lives to. Um, they're on call for them 24-7. Um, so they, they're not, they haven't got huge volumes of women on their books going through say like a private obstetrician would who would would probably only work within office hours and not at weekends we're a hundred percent there for all of our clients so we we don't earn a huge amount of money we earn less than the um, average um, salary for a, a start an entry starting um, salary for a staff midwife so no we, we the reason we do this is because we really are committed to continuity of carer and good standards that we can keep up because we have a small caseload we can really dedicate ourselves to each woman so uh you talked about this commitment 24 7 so what's the life of an independent midwife actually like kimmy <laughs> <laughs> really interesting it it clearly is um we're in it for love and for passion the the passion to keep families happy well and safe season thrive 
um, because, you know, we've all missed funerals, weddings, 18th birthday parties, christenings, Christmas, New Year's, <laughs> you know, yeah. holidays. You know, we've all booked holidays and not gone. Yeah. You know, it's, it, and, you know, we're, we're happy about it, aren't we, Jackie? You know, yeah. we, don't, we don't sit and dwell on it. It just, yeah. it just the way it is, you know, we're midwives. We're, we're going to yeah. show up and, and we're going to stay as long as it takes and we're mm -hmm. going to be happy about it. And, and yeah. the only thing that's going to matter to us is that the, the family are well, happy, warm, fed, you know, all of us, you know, if you've got someone in their 21st week who has got lots of questions, will be up at three in the morning answering those questions because we've already said to them, don't hesitate, don't go to sleep thinking about something when you've already got your midwife. You know, we want you to call. So, so many of us have been in the middle of our dinner and got oh, recognize it's the client and jumped off the table and walked outside into the back garden without a coat for hours. We've all done it. Um, yeah. But that's our calling. It really is a true calling. And, yeah. um, you know, no midwife works like this for the money no it's not enough money you could pay for us really if you yeah. if you were really paying us what we're worth no one could afford us yeah. we, we come in as part of the family o often we act like we're the mother that they haven't got in the country yeah you know, we're their mother we notice if they're pale we notice it you know or your pulse is like you've got a bead of sweat on your brow we notice these things we're part we become part of the family so yeah. and we love our life we love, we love it this is the reason we do this is because we love it we couldn't possibly do it if we didn't so for the life of an independent midwife is a joyful one we're loving it we, we're in charge of our own diaries you know we, we when we meet with our clients we're, we're meeting for coffee we, you know we're, we're gonna have we're gonna have dinner with them it, it's it's a joyful it's a joyful existence. We we love it, and and they love it. And so, so what's not to like? <laughs> so, what is the service you actually offer? Um, what would a, a couple employing an independent midwife expect right from the beginning, right through to when you wave goodbye? Can, Jackie, tell us that one. Um, well, well, they're they're, they're purchasing visits for as they're purchasing your time you're 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 booking them you're not booking anyone else you are um guaranteeing that you will be there for them that you will visit them antenatally so that you develop your relationship and you get to know one another and in, in a timely fashion so that you're not rushing anything you're you're doing all of the clinical work that you need to do as, an, as a midwife so you're doing blood pressure and you're testing urine and you're you're monitoring the baby's growth by palpating the baby touching the mate woman's tummy making a connection with the with you, the midwife and the baby, the mother and the baby, the mother and the midwife, um, getting to know the, the larger uh, family, you know, the, uh, other children, partners, mums, uncles, aunties, whoever happens to be there, you become embraced into that family and you, you're seeing them fairly frequently so that they really do start to believe that you are part of that whole process, this journey they're on, you're walking beside them, you're there for the birth um you know just being very reassuring in the corner doing absolutely nothing yeah. independent wives will do nothing they will drink tea and they will eat people out of house and home and on the, on the biscuit and pizza front but basically we do nothing we're only there to do something if things go wrong 99 percent of the time things don't go wrong and right. it's all very straightforward we're just a reassuring presence um and then postnatally, again, a really, really important part of this journey is postnatally um, that we really don't talk enough about. And again, it's about being the reassuring presence, um, bringing our skills and our experience to young families um, just to just to be there for reassurance for them and, and you know, being their photographs, you know, and, and their, their children, you know, having birthday cards sent to them and knowing that, oh, they're, they're, that's my midwife when they come to your, your, your yearly picnic or your coffee mornings that you're organising. It's, it's, it's a really lovely um, family-inclusive um, embrace. So 
Um, going back to the actual birth, what if it's a really long birth? It's Kemi, you have a go at this one. Mm -hmm. I mean, what if it's a birth which doesn't happen when you expect to happen? Mm -hmm. It might be a very long birth, or is it tend to be a shorter birth, or or what? Um. I've only on one occasion needed to hand over to another midwife just for a spell so I could sleep. Um, but usually I work with a doula and we work together to keep the family. Comfortable. And the births don't tend to be that long usually. It's quite unusual for them to be very long. I think part of that is because they know you and they're in a familiar environment. So their physiology works better. So it unfolds better. And also they're more comfortable and they trust the process more. So sometimes you might go to sleep just beside them. So, you know, mum will be asleep on the bed. Some, the, I, I remember there was a particular birth that was over a couple of days and there was a significant amount of time with mum asleep on the bed, her Labrador spooning her and me asleep on a rug on the floor next to her. And we had a lovely time. And I just wake up, I just set my clock to wake me up just to listen to the baby because we were in an early labour situation, but she really needed that reassurance of knowing that her midwife was there. So I just stayed. Um, once a woman's in established labour, labour tends to unfold fairly quickly in a few hours. Um, but yeah, we, we work it out. I think it's more realistic because we don't, time limits are not evidence-based. So, and, and most of the time when we're preparing for birth in the antenatal period, we're sharing a lot of evidence with the couples and a lot of physiology. So, you know, for us to then go against that and start driving the labour along for no reason, wouldn't, it's, it doesn't make any sense. So instead, we've got an understanding, like your midwife is human, she may need a snooze and it'll be okay. And, and then they usually say, oh, just, just lie down next to me, it's all right. And then... It's because we've become, we've become part of the family. Mm -hmm. And what if she, she needs to, does need to go to hospital? Does that happen often? What happens in that circumstance? Jackie, do you want to answer that one? Um, well, if she does need to go into hospital, then we're liaising with the hospital as her, as her midwife, as her primary care provider. We'll call ahead to the unit that she will be either local to or she's already booked into. And we'll be discussing... Um, what we think she needs on arrival and then we will prior to COVID-19 we would accompany her in and we would stay with her um, give her a, 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 a physical handover and, and a clinical handover but we would stay with her and support her act as her birth support throughout whatever is going to be happening from that point onwards explaining all of the options that are being presented to her and giving her protecting some space so that she can think those through and doesn't feel that she's being rushed into something that maybe she hadn't quite thought about mostly you've covered all the bases with her ahead of time in a just-in-case scenario, these are the things that might be important for you to have a think about and maybe have made a decision prior to, but we will we will then um, hold that birth plan or those birth preferences that she's made to us antenatally for her to the staff that are there. But we, we do remain with her and, and make sure that she's she's as informed and as and in control of that situation as she can be. And does that happen very often? Very, very rarely. Um, in the majority of women who are booking to stay at home will and will succeed um, having a, ba a baby at home. Uh, on very rare oca occasions, that sometimes a baby needs a bit of help to be to be born. It's. I can tell you that I've never been involved in a blue light incident. I, I, I don't think that you know this mad crash emergency scenarios that you see on TV that happen around birth. That's unheard of. That's just not something that happens. It, it, ha it may happen within an NHS setting because, of course, they're very busy and they're working with several women at one time and they may just not have missed something. They may have missed something on, on, a, on a, a monitor trace and then suddenly they'll pop in having delivered the lady next door and find, oh, we seem to be um, having a problem here that we should have been acting on. Let's get quickly down the corridor to theatre. So that tends to happen in a setting where there are well, there's one midwife looking after several women um, in a in, in in an independent midwifery setting. That's almost unheard of. Can we get on to the thorny question of insurance? 
because the reason really for us having this conversation today is that the number of independent midwives is dwindling, yes. which is terrible. Um, and it is because a few years ago, there was an EU directive that no midwife could practice without insurance. Up to that point, independent midwives were practicing without insurance. They were perfectly open about it. They told the women, but you couldn't get insurance. Um, and nobody ever made a claim or sued an independent midwife, so she lost her house or anything like that, did they? No. But then the EU regulation came in and the insurance com um, question became prominent. And Jackie, you more than anybody else have been grappling with this appalling, logistical, bureaucratic situation for a number of years. Can you tell us about it? This is why we're making it, because it is so important that independent midwives get can continue, and it's mm. the insurance which is, may prevent them. Yes. So the insurance um, issue is a real sticky one because on on the surface, it, it seems like a really good idea to have um, health professionals having professional indemnity insurance. Now, an indemnity insurance policy that we're talking about is actually there to protect the health professional, not the woman. Um, and unfortunately, um, independent midwifery, midwifery in general, tends to be looked at, as does birth, as a dangerous activity. Um, and um, that's culturally, we think that birth is, is dangerous because a myth has been allowed to grow, uh, fueled by Hollywood uh, because they're in the entertainment business and they want to make birth look entertaining. Actually, birth is very boring. It's all about overeating. It's about the midwife sitting in the corner and just munching away through a packet of biscuits. It's not about screaming and shouting and rushing around and, you know, hot water and towels. That's not what happens. That only happens in Hollywood. And unfortunately, that has built up, um, that's allowed the myth of the dangerous activity of birth to, 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 to kind of build. And so therefore insurance brokers and underwriters think that this is the activity that we're trying to participate in. So they are very nervous around providing a policy. So the insurance in the UK for um, midwives has been non-existent until about 2017, when we had been struggling for a very long time from 2014 to 2017 to try to, um, to come up with our own insurance product. The insurance world was watching what we were doing and finally thought, yes, okay, they don't seem to be having crazy stats, they seem to have actually excellent stats, so therefore we'll offer them a policy. Unfortunately, um, that only lasted two years because we then started to have our government started to talk about Brexit and Brexit was making the international company that was providing us with our insurance at that time very nervous because they felt that they didn't feel they wanted to stay in the UK to trade. Um, so they started to say that they thought they were going to be withdrawing their services, they wouldn't be renewing our policy for us. Um, that then was confirmed um, fo quickly following as we were trying to negotiate with other firms that were looking at our low risk stats that they might give us a policy they quite quickly um, withdrew all these very positive noises for giving us a new policy because of the pandemic COVID-19 they became very overwhelmed very quickly with COVID-19 claims um, from other businesses within their sectors so they they've just been refusing to um, write up any new business therefore independent midwives in the UK today are banned from working because they do not have this um, requirement for, for professional indemnity insurance and we are we, we just we can't we can't express in more strong terms how devastating this is simply because especially because of the pandemic we've had a massive increase in inquiries from desperate women who suddenly have the penny has dropped where they previously thought, oh, they would just go into hospital. They suddenly realised with a pandemic, you know, closing the country down and hospitals being, you know, really put under a lot of stress and strain for 
um, staffing and also for infection, women suddenly thought, actually, I'd like I'd like to not go into hospital and I'd really like to have my baby at home. Um, unfortunately, we weren't able to, pr- to, to plug that hole where we would normally have been able to do that. We couldn't because we are not allowed to practice without our insurance. So women have been turning more and more to birthing on their own um, through not through a want, but through a necessity from their perspective, because they are very anxious about infection rates. So it's a bit of a mess and we haven't managed to find our way out of it yet. What about if women are wanting to birth at home, why won't the NHS support them? I think the NHS has been really stretched during pandemic and they have felt that um, they haven't got the staff. They would prefer to take all of their community staff into the hospital to cover what's going on in the hospitals. Um, So they have closed down some of their home birth services. But you also do have many. I don't think our infrastructure was ready for an increase in home birth demand. So Mm. there still are many um, NHS trained midwives who have a great discomfort with attending birth in a home setting. Oh, absolutely. Of course, we we don't have, we don't have, great teams of community midwifery that, that 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 are very comfortable with home birth simply because for very a great many years we've had less and less um uh, kind of investment in the nhs and midwifery services have been um tightened up just providing core staff within the hospital setting um, and even then we've still we've still been hearing for many many years that there's, there's, a, there's a, a, a massive uh, dearth of, of midwives that are needed they, we need more midwives within the profession women have have been struggling for a long time even to have uh, you know a unit fully staffed for women going into hospital with midwives so unfortunately yes we've got we've got all sorts of issues on all sorts of levels that are causing problems for women and for midwives who want to who are trying to provide a service within the mainstream um, employer role that i.e the nhs but also for anyone who wants to work outside of that there is very limited options available to women for out even outside of that you either go to a private hospital and you see a private obstetrician um and you may not be wanting What's to have an obstetric leg well it's just obstetricians are surgeons and you know they're really they're, they're, they're they very rarely um, spend time with a labouring woman from, from a woman from the beginning of her labour to the end, which is what women are looking for. They're looking for their, their carer to be with them so that they've got confidence and trust in that person, but they need them to be their whole experience. And um, people, they're surgeons, they're often in theatre, and so they come in at the very last minute and some, you know, a lot of women don't want that that type of care. Some women do, and it works beautifully for them, but some women don't. And we, a midwife would be the, the way forward for the majority of women in the UK. What is the relative cost of a private obstetrician and an independent midwife? And the insurance cost, because the obstetricians have to have insurance, don't they? So they've got it. An obstetrician will have an, um, an, an insurance policy. Yes, there are more of them than there are of us. So therefore, they can get a, an affordable insurance product. Um, they will be um, insured for uh, surgical procedures. Um, so they're looking, they're looking at something like £7,000 per woman as an insurance premium independent midwives at the last ditch attempt that we had just before july were quoted seven thousand five hundred pounds per woman for as an insurance policy so clearly that was totally inappropriate and unaffordable you couldn't ask a woman to pay seven thousand five hundred pounds and still have to pay a midwife her fee on top of that that's totally unaffordable i believe um, um and unattainable for the midwife as well so um an, an independent midwife will charge between four thousand and seven thousand pounds for her, her full care package depending on where you are in the country um and a an obstetrician will be charging anything from 
£23,000 for a full care package, if you're looking at, say, the Portland, that's just a basic package, to possibly a little bit less if he's only going to be there for a um, small portion of your labour only. So my understanding is that it's, it's a much more expensive activity to um, be engaging an, uh, an obstetrician than it would be an, an independent midwife, and you get less of their time um, from an obstetrician than you would from an independent midwife. But also, can I just add yes, that it's not just a matter of the time, is it, Jackie? Because we're also looking at expertise. You mentioned earlier that they're surgeons, so their expertise is surgery. Um, mm. There was a there was a study yes. that, that eighty five percent of women are actually looking for a physiological birth. In, you know, and, and to come out of it in the best possible condition, them and their baby, which is not the obstetrician's expertise. So um, it, it, it just, it, you can't, it, when it comes to the comparison of the financial costs of each even, you've got to look at the cost of employing an obstetrician to help you manage a physiological birth because... They, yeah. they, they don't know how to do that because they don't see it. No. Yeah, so That's right. you end up paying more than just the money for yeah. having a medic involved in your what you're hoping to be a vaginal birth in a home-like setting. Yes. Kim, we've talked from time to time about stats and safety. Could you talk a little bit more about what your stats are? Um, yeah. I don't know. How, how often do you, for example need to do a vaginal examination? How often do you need to transfer in? Or anything else that comes to mind? Yeah, what are your safety records? In the average year, I would say I probably would do one, um, well, maybe repeat a vaginal examination two or three times for one woman for that year. So that year would probably have between 24 and 30 women in it, depending on whether I'm a second midwife for some births or not. Um, so you probably have one woman getting, um, receiving a vaginal examination. Reluctantly, I don't like to do them. It, it kind of disturbs a woman's bubble, you know, having to get out of that space, that, that psychological space. You know, if I was to do it in a pool, it would be better. Um, sometimes if, if I'm really doing it because it has to be done because the path of labor looks unusual or she's getting stressed or says she needs help or she feels the baby's stuck or something, then I have to get her out of her watery space. And so, you know, it's very reluctant to do it. So we try, we, we deduce progress using other means. Most of us, you know, that's how I was trained by independent midwives mm. to look for other signs. And it's, and it's, it's, it served me and the people I look after well. So that'd be one. So transfers, there may be two for that year. So, and, and then if the two, the two that go in, one may have a cesarean and one will have a vaginal birth, but just in the hospital. So the transfers could be for thick meconium, for instance. We know the thick meconium is usually a sign that there's some kind of obstruction to the labor that you may still overcome with the, with the car ride. But, you know, so, so, but you're still ending up in a, in a situation where if the thick meconium was to be aspirated, that baby would receive some help. So, so, you know, the transfer, whenever I talk about the possibility of transfer with parents, I always mention that it, it doesn't mean that your birth plan is out the window. It, it's just a change of venue and I will be staying with you and you'll still be ticking most things off of that birth plan at the end. And that's how it happens. And, if, um, if, say, we are transferring and there's a high chance of there being a cesarean as the outcome, I would have already deduced that. So that's what I've been taught by other independents as well, you know, how to start that conversation slowly, rather than throwing her in there and being acting shocked. You know, start that conversation early, explain the evidence and the physiology around it. So she still feels in control. She still feels like she's got a choice when she goes in there. She's not suddenly thrown into this scenario. So, yeah, about, say, two out of 24, 30, so it's way, way below 10% for transfers. So cesareans, really small, like one in that cohort per year, you know, in the average year would have... Um, that sounds like 4%. Yeah, yeah, 
That's right. Which is what we'd expect from when you look at other physiological birth keepers, that's their stat, four or five percent. Mm. But what is um, the national average? 30 now, isn't it? 30%? Between 30 and 33%, yes. Yeah. So, but but this is not me being special. This is all IMs. They, they all yes. have these stats. Um, and I, I, you know, I think what makes the difference is them as us being known um, and our couples being prepared, rational. You know, in all this time, I've never had anyone say, well, no, I'm not doing that. Never, you know, mm. we build the relationship and and whenever I make a recommendation, it's made of respect and, and reminding them that I absolutely know you can just say no. And they never do. They say, well, that's why we chose you. We trust you. Let's go. Yeah. What about a um, uh, pretty major pump, um, topic at the moment, I think, but it's a worse epidemic than COVID, the epidemic of induction of labour. Do you want to talk about that, Kemi? Oh, I can't. Can I trust you? <laughs> Should I have <laughs> to about it? My personal cohort, no one has ever chosen induction. So it's it's fascinating. I, it's just amazing. Why not? Because uh, um, the, the, we're in think for if they have a long pregnancy, the, um, the stillbirth rate increases, they are put under pressure, they're frightened. So why don't you all the facts? And the facts are quite sketchy, as we know. Trying to get those facts about actual stillbirth rates is challenging. You know, Swepis couldn't achieve it. They stopped the trial. And then um, there's this new um, review that I need to look at, Mooglu. But even we're still always talking about very tiny figures. Um, so I, all I can do is give them the stats, um, speak with them about, you know, how a well baby feels, what's your baby's usual pattern, you know, every, you know, the slightest thing, if they, they feel free to send me a picture, no matter how gory it is, you know, I'll get a picture of something on a pad or something. But that really helps them to maintain trust in themselves and the process. And, it, it, you know, it, it's trust in themselves that makes or breaks this. It's not even trust in me. It's like, I've, I've conceived this baby, I've grown this baby, do I trust myself in the process to complete, to complete the process? So, mm -hmm. I, and I just reflect back to them, whatever, they've, whatever they want, I reflect back, whatever they show me, I tell them what it is, and they just end up being able to wait. It was fascinating. Okay, do you want to add to that? Yeah, no, I, I agree with what Kemi is saying. And, and I do also agree that it is an epidemic. Um, you know, we do seem to be uh, talking to all women who go through uh, a maternity um, episode by around about 38 to 39 weeks, talking about the potential for an induction that could be booked between 40 and 41 weeks. Um, and this is a kind of a standard pattern of... of of care that's offered. Um, we'll also be talking to women a lot about, oh, having a stretch and sweep. Well, we can, we can offer you a stretch and sweep. And it's always delivered in such a, well, it's just a little thing that we're going to do. It, you know, it gives you the best chance of, of maybe go, having, in, having a natural, a spontaneous labour. But that's a form of, indu that's the first stage to an induction. And it's not explained in that in that way, women are told, oh, I'm, I'm going to go in and they're going to do a stretch and sweep. And, you know, it gives me the best chance of going into spon natural spontaneous labor. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. It's not natural and spont spontaneous, I would argue, if you are doing something to start it. And I think it's that, oh, we're just going to do that. And, and you know, it, oh, it's nothing really to worry about. I think that approach is why we are seeing it as the epidemic that it is, because it's not it's just not put forward correctly. It's not, it's not offered to women correctly. And women often feel that they don't have a choice either. It's like, oh, well, this is what's going to happen. This is your induction date. It's happening when you're 41 weeks plus two days. That's what we do in this trust. Down the road, the, the trust down the road is doing it at 41 weeks plus five days. And they're thinking they're marvellous because they've given you a few extra days. All of the women in that are sitting are, thinking, well, I have to, to, to subject myself to this. I don't have a choice. Um, and and I, it's, that's just not the way it is. There is no evidence that supports that kind of 
structure and way forward for, for women coming towards the end of their pregnancy. Um, so it is a bit of a problem and it's really important that women understand that everything that is suggested to you is suggested to you as an offer. It's like a menu. You can choose something off it or you can choose not to. You don't have to take whatever it is they're giving you. Um, and I think independent midwifery clients who are mostly self-selected, they will come to you because they've been doing some reading. They're, you know, they're, they're very motivated to try to do the best for themselves and their babies. They've, they've already been there, done that. They've been looking at that at the very early stages of, lay, uh, of their pregnancy, looking at this, this, the state of play around induction because they probably all have um, friends, sisters, cousins, People who have been involved in having babies, having gone down this this path, and they thought that maybe that wasn't so great because you know there wasn't such a great outcome, i.e., straightforward um, vaginal births. So they will have already have thought about it, and and often they will continue to to, to keep looking at the most up to date evidence and research, and will then say thanks but no thanks I'll just wait. And I've got confidence that my body's in my body's ability and my baby's ability to you know go through the process of labor more much more beneficially for them if if they were allowed to have a spontaneous birth as opposed to an induced birth Kimmy, do you want to I add something yes please <laughs> yes. i get inspired when jackie talks because um <laughs> you know this 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 whole idea of the sweep and um i i remember being at a course i'm not sure if i was with you catherine where um uh, no, I was with Nancy, and I asked how many, it was a midwife's course, and I asked how many people do you think receive a membrane sweep, you know, as a proportion of the people that you see every year, and they said they feel that around 90% of women um, receive a membrane sweep in their services. So when you, when you contrast that with, Jackie, you know, alluded to the fact that it cascades, it goes, you, it starts with a sweep, then it becomes something else and becomes something else because spontaneous labor is our human blueprint. When we start fidgeting with services and things like that, we're, we're diverting it away from spontaneous and the blueprint. So, so when we as IMs resist any kind of interference with the, with the woman, in, which includes a membrane sweep, can can I hope people can start to see how that connects with the good outcomes because we're always waiting for spontaneous labor so we're waiting for the breech baby to come spontaneously we're waiting for the twins to come spontaneously we're making into the cephalic baby we're waiting for the the home birth after three cesareans to come spontaneously it immediately improves the chances of there being a birth without drama mm. And, and that's what most people don't get to see because most people are giving birth within the services where they're being swept nine times out of 10 and then it's cascading. And then the then it get, natural labor gets a really bad press and it's getting yeah. worse year on year. Like, oh, you know, I had a natural labor and this and this happened. Then you dig a bit and then you realize, oh, I was, I was swept four times, you know, before. But they don't equate that to being an intervention. Yeah. Yes. So I just needed to add that. Kemi, you've just said that unwinding the cord is poor practice. It's one of the big worries of many mums that the cord will be wound round the neck. So why is it poor practice to unwind the cord? It's poor practice to unwind the cord when the, only the baby's head is born because when the rest of the baby is being born, there'll usually be enough slack for the baby to be born with the cord still wound and then unwind it. You're not creating extra tension. When you try and do it with the baby's head born only, you're causing extra tension on the cord, which could then separate from the baby's umbilicus, so it could snap. And then you've got a baby with no oxygen supply. The reason why we can allow the cord to remain around the baby's neck is because that's the source of their oxygen. And it's intact all through the labor. And probably the cord has been around the neck for the few weeks before the labor even started and the baby's still getting a, a blood supply that's not occluded. As soon as we start fidgeting with it, we can cause it to, cause it to go into stenosis, so it just stop. And then we can also cause it to snap. If you leave it intact, blood continues to go to the baby. And then when the baby's fully born, you can casually unwrap it. 
If the baby's born underwater, you can unwrap it underwater and the baby won't attempt to breathe till you bring it up into air. So there's a somersault maneuver as well. Sarah Wickham was sharing an amazing website about the somersault maneuver. Even if you have taken up some of your slack with the cord in, in the birth of the baby, um, you can do the somersault maneuver by holding the baby's heads in, head in place. The uterine contraction would then push the baby's body past their head and then you can unwrap the cord. So you never have to separate the cord or divide it. Or and historically, um, our training has included not only um, pulling the cord over the baby's head if we, if we identified it to be around the neck as the head was born, it was also very often clamped and cut at that point too, in which case you were definitely oh. re reducing oxygen flow to the baby um, and we would often see um, the baby faint as a consequence of that action and they would lose tone, become very floppy. And then once the baby was born, would need some resuscitation, some help to get the oxygen back into its body. And that was always perceived to be the reason why we needed to do that in the first place was because clearly the baby was in trouble and was, was clearly going to need to have some level of resuscitation. Having got you know moved on with our um experience and 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 spending time with more experienced midwives uh slapping your hands away when you try to do that uh, as a as a very young midwife um you can quite clearly see that these babies do not need assistance are very you know that whole process is very natural and that babies um do not need resuscitation if you've left their cords alone um, after they've till after they've been born and you just unravel them at that point so that that's something that it has stood out in my mind very much because i could never quite understand the logic that was being suggested to me in clinical practice as opposed to understanding the academic researched evidence based um, information we were given in university just like Kimmy says I love that Jackie but you're going for logic 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 and instinct you mentioned then you mentioned um, vaginal birth after cesarean your clientele what range of women does it cover what are their conditions for women are there many who are just having a normal spontaneous first birth or is it the nice, the other yoga <laughs> yeah because everyone thinks that we're just looking after you know the people that are upper middle class mm. yoga teacher size 10 you know uh, that pops babies out really easily when cat i mean you you know jackie yeah. we will tend to have the women yeah we will have that woman that's really healthy having her first birth she was born at home it, and it all unfolds smoothly. But most of the clients we look after, the ones that have had a first birth that has gone very weird. So, yeah. you know, third degree tears, for, you know, because people think this is all normal, but this is so unusual. I've never seen a third degree tear. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they've had third degree tears or they've had a forceps birth or they've got a traumatized partner or they've had two cesareans before or they've got a baby that's considered upside down. Um, we'll be getting those families approaching us and saying, please, can you help us? Because we're struggling to get anyone to listen to us and treat us like an adult within maternity services. So, yeah. so we've usually got really interesting cases like, you know, gestational diabetes, you know, we've got loads of wonderful fodder. That's why we know so much about these things because we're forced to learn it because of our clients. They come and say, what, you, what can you do for me? <laughs> we, have to, we have to deliver and we can't just sit there and hum and hope for the best. We need to yeah. stay evidence-based and physiological when in our approach. Yeah. Quite rightly so, you know. Yeah, Jackie, you're sitting there nodding. Have you got something to add to that? Yeah, no, I would say that, you know, my, uh, my own uh, caseload groups over the years, I, I would say about 70% of my caseload uh, for any one year will be a previous cesarean section or, um, you know, previous forceps or a previous third degree tear. Or, you know, th those, those are the, the kind of women that are coming to us because we are... We, we do hold the skills, the, the expertise in these areas, simply because we've looked after so many of these women. And we're really com comfortable looking after these women because we, we read evidence, we read the research, and the research supports that these 
uh, women can go forward and have vaginal birth. This is you just have to support her and make sure that you protect her space, which is what we do. That's our bread and butter. We are we literally are independent midwives. Literally are receptacles for all of the knowledge that we're, we're losing fast from the midwifery profession. You've moved on to what I was just going to say. Um, why? I, a tiny group of women, okay, you, you care for, you have a very important role, but the women who you care for have to pay. Um, you're a dwindling in number all the time because of the insurance question. Um, I mean, how many midwives would you, independent midwives would you say there are, are now as opposed to three or five years ago? Half um, a number? We, oh, yeah. I mean, f five years ago, we had 150 independent midwives across the country. Um, today, we've got 50, 55. Um, there, we have 1,500 um, expressions of interest um, of wanting to be working in a self-employed way if the insurance was was resolved but obviously we've been like knee deep trying to wade our way through this particular problem for the last six to seven years um so i think and then we also need to know that there's five thousand and more um midwives are on the register but are not practicing waiting watching looking for anything other another way to work and i think that you know that there really is potentially going to be a big boom a possible a possible big boom at once we re resolve our insurance scenarios so what are you trying to achieve in the insurance area at the moment we're just looking for somebody How to can give people help people can help by um donating we 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 we're trying we're running a campaign to um to to kind of fund our own insurance product so because the, the commercial markets just don't seem to have the understanding and they're very temperamental depending on what's going on globally. You know, they're, they're really focused on profit margins and they need to be making money. At the moment, you know, a small number of midwives needing a policy isn't going to be providing them with a great deal of profit. So we need to be able to do this for ourselves. Women need to be able to, to do this for themselves. So we're looking at, um, we've set up a campaign, a Just Giving campaign. It's, it's actually a Givey platform that we're um, working with, where we're asking women to donate money into that pot so that we can collect enough money. We're looking to, uh, to raise three million pounds so that we can um, um, pr produce our own indemnity policy. That's, that's uh, an insurance type policy. Um, that allows midwives to tick the box that says we are complying with the legislation and we can then therefore go back to work. We're not trying to do anything more than that. We are just asking to uh, be able to do our job and we need this money in order to do that. So we ca I can give you the well, details. Talk about women um, donating, which I'm sure many women who have used an independent midwife would desperately want to ensure the service continues. Uh, what about, most women don't have pots of money. No. Uh, there are charities, there are trusts, which have, to whom three million pounds would actually be peanuts. Mm -hmm. So I think also if anybody watched this, who had access to anything like that, which could help um, donate, raise funds, um, which are, you know, they're, they're earmarked, you can, nobody can get, get hold of them, so that that insurance um, pot is there. And midwives can pay their premiums, practice really safely, but they have to have that for law. Um, so there might be somebody who knows somebody who has access to that sort of funds or does themselves. And we really, really want people to be aware. And in those terms, this is a tiny amount of money. I know it's a huge amount of money for you or I, but it really isn't, is it? No, not in the grand scheme of things. It's not. No, absolutely not. Um, and we really would, um, we do, it's, it's entirely possible. We just need women to know about it. We need to um, ask people to maybe donate their, donate their birthdays or, you know, you know, 
give us something give us give us a christmas present this year of a donation it can be anything it could be a pound it could be 10 pounds anything is going to be helpful and we, if enough people do that we'll reach our goal and we'll be able to provide a service we're also looking to um provide um a separate fund for women who can't afford independent midwifery services because there is a massive need for independent midwifery services but not necessarily in the ability for some women to access them there are midwives all of the independent midwives will take on pro, pro bono cases so there are some women that that are getting their services even though they can't afford it but we're hoping to set up a fund as well as, as also part of the the campaign that we're running so that women can access um you know excellent standard of care with, with the continuity of care a model that the um, better birth 2017 recommended and the government accepted as the way forward um we this we're the only way that that's that's happening right now and we'd love for all women to be able to access this level of care and this level of of um, support from a, a known midwife so um yeah we need we need your money please give us your money but and, and it doesn't matter how small it is it's all going to help and we the more that we can more people we can reach the faster we're going to achieve our goal so it all sounds as if it's very much down to you is the minister of health of health aware of what's going on yes the minister of health is aware the prime minister is aware um <laughs> anyone who lives in a constituency and is dealing um with uh, their local mps that have brought it to their attention so there there are there have been many many members of parliament that have been aware and have been trying to help us um over this number of years that we've been working on this we've got an amazing advocate um in baroness cumberlich she was the author of the better births um, report of 2017. She's she's a great advocate for us and really tries to push us in front of the right political bodies. But so far, we're just not in, in, interesting enough to them. There are other things on their minds. They've got and I, clearly this year they've been dealing with COVID-19. Um, but we're we're too small a number, and we we represent we, we look after women, and, and I don't really think that women it's very high women and their needs are very high priority politically and so we need to get out there we need to be disobedient so we need to be prepared to stop being nice i really really think that this is the way forward we need to say what we want we have to stop pretending to ourselves and others that it's okay for you to ignore us and it's okay for us to put up with this no i think women have to be um you know very forthcoming and say actually this is unacceptable we want this level of care um you've endorsed this level of care for everyone through accepting the better births 2017 recommendations i'm gonna make i'm gonna hold you to your promise let's um let's support the independent midwives so who speaks for you do you have to speak for yourself does the royal college of midwives speak for you no so it's all down to you it is it's down to us it has been the independent midwives from the from day one that have been independent midwives uk that, that have been doing the majority of this campaigning um it, it's now it's now over to you the women women are the ones that need to take this forward women have a huge amount of power they just need to come together and say enough um our college sadly isn't um very good at supporting midwives um they they also feel very conflicted because we are not mainstream employed and obviously they feel an, an allegiance with an with the nhs service which of course we all feel that allegiance but unfortunately um or fortunately for us we've got that as an option as, as an option but it, it doesn't meet everybody's needs and i think it's only right that midwives can also have the ability to be self-employed just like everybody else on in the uk um so i really would have appreciated some more endorsement from the royal college of midwives but it's just not there so it really is up to us and our clients we all need choice every single one of us on you know in the uk on the planet we need choice we need to feel that we have control um we will only have a, a thriving midwifery profession if we all feel um, valued in 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 our work arena and I, I hand on heart 100 
independent midwifery gives you that. Um, now, that obviously is hugely important for midwives. But the question that I would like to address now, um, and I would like, if, if that's okay, to say something first, is why is this important for us all? Um, and it, it is, as you say, that there is an alternative. There is no other area of medicine where there isn't an alternative, mm -hmm. where you cannot go to a private practitioner if you felt the waiting lists were too long or it was a particular person or, or whatever. There is no other area, and I hesitate to say medicine when it's birth because it's not medicine, but you know what I mean. Um, clinical care, uh, where you can, there is no choice for the mums, for anybody. Now, so what are we left with? We are left with a bureaucratic monopoly, the NHS. Now, this is not a complaint about people in the NHS, and many people would agree that we need to have a total um, new look. That's a separate issue. But a bureaucratic monopoly in any field is not a good thing. Um, and what the independent midwives do is they hold up a mirror to the NHS of what excellent can be. And since there is, people can see that, um, if that wasn't there, oh, that's how it is. But now uh, you can say, that's how it could be. And to me, that is a really, really important thing um, that we will lose. Uh, you've talked already about better births, which is an initiative uh, to make the NHS services more user-friendly for mothers and babies. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing is that what they are trying to introduce, and it's, there's a lot of big input, impulse to introduce that at the moment, is what the independents were doing anyway, yes. beautifully. That's, they're only introducing it because they could see how good uh, the service that independents provided was. So you destroy independent midwifery, and then late, further down the line you think, oh, that was pretty good. I wonder if we can start to introduce it. And it gets way, it was being done anyway. Mm. And yet there was no support for it at that point. Mm -hmm. um, but a bureaucratic monopoly in any field and something as important as birth is appalling. Uh, do you want to add to that, Kimmy? Yeah, um, I'd say that this bureaucratic monopoly has been killing any of the alternatives. So we know about Albany, um, we know about one-to-one. -one. Um, Nobody does, Kenny, you do, I do. Uh, but People yeah. watching this might not. You might just briefly yeah. say what they were. Yeah, these are alternatives where they were bringing this model of care, um, one to one continuity of carer, to families and serving the family, um, minimizing that control that's, that, that, that attempts to be had over the family's choices, like whether they're having twins at home, whether they're having a home birth after three cesareans, etc. Um, they really tried to ensure that the families got their choices and got their maintained control. These groups so, of midwives were working within the NHS, weren't they? But they were independent they midwives. Were That's the point. Yeah, so they were, they, they'd set up their group and they'd be align, aligned with the NHS in some way. So they might be receiving funding from the NHS or referrals from the NHS. So the ones that always come to mind, you have the Airedale midwives in Yorkshire that were, were being insured to look after families in that area. So they were receiving insurance through the NHS. Then we had Albany, Albany midwives that were um, within the King's College Hospital um, Trust who were looking after a certain area, quite a, a challenged demographic and having amazing results. They produced a paper a, a year ago or so. Um, but they were stamped, they, they were stamped out, they were got rid of. Then you had the one-to-one -one midwives, you had neighbourhood midwives. Um, so every attempt there's been to create that scenario for the benefit of families, and be aligned with the NHS has been stamped out by the very trust that they're aligned with. So when you've, when you've got that happening, it can make you begin to feel that there's one remaining option, but at the moment, um, that remaining option 
they also are controlling families in a way that, oh, you, your baby's turned breech, we can't look after you anymore, or you've had too many cesareans, we can't look after you anymore. And then they're really controlling the midwives that they've encouraged over to their side. So, so th there, aren't, there aren't any true options for true self-employed midwives that want to work direct to the family, but the options that we did have um, they've all been disappeared too in the last two years. Well, at Albany went about 10 years ago, but then the others, they, they kind of disappeared one after the other really quickly. So, so there's something about this bureaucratic monopoly that you're mentioning that actually kills its young and, and it's unhealthy. And, and it worries me at what choices are being left for families giving birth now and future children. I've, I've looked after women recently who've cried for their children and said, so what about when she wants to give birth now? So they've had their amazing birth and then they're in tears a couple of days later over their child saying, well, how's she going to give birth? Who's going to be there for her? Why would we in the, why would we be in this situation? You know, things are supposed to be getting better, but actually getting worse. Yeah, I think I think we have to remember that um, we the medical profession has has a, a motto that they live by: first, do no harm. Nobody is is living up to this. We are doing harm, and the people who are trying to not do harm and to just offer women nurturing, safe care are being eliminated. Um, and we have to stop it. It's up to us. It's up to us, the women. We must stop it. Um, so I'm just going to appeal to you to, to kind of think about this and, and what it's worth to you. And it may not be you. It may be your sister. It may be your niece. It may be your granddaughter. All of these women need you to need us. So please, please help us um, to make this to reverse this nasty trend and to make sure that the women of the future are strong, disobedient women um, who are healthy and thriving because they've had the best start in life um, from their mothers being nurtured by a midwife, a known midwife. So if there are any, um, any amazing and amazingly generous um, organisations who, who want to also contribute and help us provide this level of service for everyone. There is a fantastic um, website that you can go to where you can donate um, money or we can put you in touch with uh, the campaign manager who would be delighted to take your call and have a conversation with you about how you can support and help us um, fulfill this dream that we've got that we, we feel this is, is entirely achievable but we really would need your support for um, please give us a call or send us an email we'll put the we'll put the address up on the screen shortly so that you know where to contact um, both the fundraising account and the, the coordinator if you want to give us something else as well which I'm really hoping that you will do you're two amazing women thank you so much subscribe and then you'll get all our most up-to-date information.